Charlotte Nickdow plays Poppy in Mythic Quest on Apple. I'm at Noble and Gold Derby, and I wanted to check in with you, Charlotte. Last year when we spoke, uh, you said that, like, Iron is such so obviously a jerk on the show that it's uh, rare moments that you see Poppy's true jerkiness shine through. Um, let's check in with how she's going in season two, <laughs> having her jerkiness shine through. Uh, how do you think she's tracking this year? I think that her jerkiness is on full display this year. Uh, I had so much fun playing with this. And I will say, like, it was definitely cool having an idea of this is where we wanted to go with the character in season one because I was able to infuse a little bit of that jerkiness. But I think in season one, I mean, we may have even talked about this last year. She's the underdog. So you're rooting for her even if she's imperfect. Whereas in season two, she's no longer the underdog. And in many ways, she's the top dog. And so now when she's an ass, can I say asshole on you Gold say, Derby? Say whatever you like on Gold Derby. Now that she, uh, now that she's got all this power, her true, her true assholiness is really shining through, uh, which is, yeah, a, a delicious thing to get to play. Yeah, uh, what, what, like, is it? So it's fun playing a jerk. Yes, absolutely. I feel like in real life. Look, I'm not going to be one of those actors that's like, I'm really nice in real life, so it's fun to get to play someone mean. But I do think that in real life I am extremely neurotic about what people think of me and how things that I say are going to come across. And Poppy is a character that absolutely doesn't give a shit about that. I think she cares that people think she's smart. She cares that people think that she's good at her job. She doesn't, I mean, she didn't come here to make friends. And that is a really fun thing to get to play. Yeah, and you talk about like sort of where like Poppy's grown into in her role in the show and you were sort of, I think last year you said that that originally Poppy was meant to start on a more even footing with Iron and that was changed. So what's it like to now arrive at that point? I mean, it's been, I really loved getting the opportunity to get to play that journey a little bit. So you do get to see her find different kinds of confidence in herself, uh, understand a little bit better what it means to trust her own instincts. And then I think just uh, as an actor, you know, when I came on to season one, I was acting opposite Rob McElhenney, who is an absolute master of his craft and also was my actual and is my actual boss on the show. Mm. And so I think there was always a natural element of, uh, I don't know if reverence is the right word, but, you know, I had and have a lot, a lot of respect for him, which in season one, I think it comes through in the performance of Poppy not quite knowing how to get on even footing. Whereas I think in season two, you know, we'd, we'd shot a, a season of television together. We made the quarantine episode last year, which I think brought all of us much closer together, ironically, considering it was all done remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, and so coming into season two, I think he and I had this uh, growing rapport that was, uh, instrumental in the way that the relationship functions this season and uh i i really appreciated the opportunity to um get to let that part of the character and that part of the relationship shine hmm. is it more like uh you and rose relationship more functional or less functional than poppy and iron Oh, so much more functional. Oh, I, mean, I, I made a thinking face because I thought you were going to say first, second season. No, no, no. <laughs> Rob and I, <laughs> Rob and I get along great, and uh, it's it's really helpful when we're shooting comedic scenes because we bounce off of each other. We, I think, we both find each other really funny. Um, I learn a lot from him just getting to work with him. He really knows what he's doing, and so I always feel like I'm like yeah i'm getting a bit of a master class every time i do a scene with him but then on top of that we have had a bunch of scenes um both last season and this season that are a bit more dramatic and a bit heavier and i think having that friendship that we have off screen is really helpful when we have to delve into the more vulnerable parts of the relationship and look like i think the the parallel that the sort of show is used for um, your professional relationship uh, or Poppy's professional relationship with Iron is like a marriage. 
and like yeah. sort of like this this marriage at sort of like on tenterhooks or on on very thin ice um and <laughs> it's sort of funny i guess like if you carry that analogy through um you know, if like you guys were like professionally dating last season, it was a pretty volatile relationship then. And it's definitely spilled over into the marriage of yes. you guys. And and one of the things we talk about in the show is the idea of the video game that they're creating being their baby. Mm. And so this is the thing that keeps this toxic relationship together. And it's as an actor, it's so great to have that anchor because you're playing this character that in many ways is inherently opposed to everything that uh, Rob's character, Ian, is. Like these two characters have really, they have the same sized egos, but they're coming at the same project from completely different perspectives. And so for a lot of reasons, if you wanted to play that authentically, you'd be like, well, then why does she keep working with him? Why, why does she keep putting up with having to compromise her own vision? And it's because she cares so deeply about this game or their baby and she knows that the baby is is going to be its best if it has its mother and its father both taking care of it so even though she kind of hates him she has to put up with it yeah and this this season sort of poppy was the sellout with the battle royale yes. so <laughs> so yeah, like, yeah, yeah like, I think, you know, I got to access all these really uh, sometimes sad, but mostly very funny levels of desperation this mm -hmm. season. You know, she's gotten everything she's ever dreamed of. She has creative control over her game now and she has a vision, but she's realizing how hard it is to execute something when there are no roadblocks in your way other than yourself. And I think that spins her out. And in trying to buy time and space for herself, she makes a lot of really bad decisions. And you sort of see the way that that then informs, you know, we haven't, I don't know when this comes out, we haven't aired the finale yet, but uh, it is leading to some discoveries that she makes about where her creative vision is taking her. Yeah. What, like this is an interesting thing. Like there, there, there've been a lot of big sort of fights between uh, your character and Iron in the show, and the 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 last ep the most recent episode, the one that came out like yesterday or today or something. Um, yeah, there was a real conflict between you guys, but it was a much quieter conflict in some ways. You cut each other without the big shouting, but more just some very uh, savage things. Is like, what was it like going at that sort of different pace? I mean, firstly, that whole episode was a dream come true. I mean, I I loved getting to shoot our Everlight episode, which which was the bridging episode between season one and two, uh, where we got to do a full on fantasy sequence. And and I feel like I've said a bunch of times like that was as an actor, you have like a list of things you want to do. And that ticked off a whole bunch of things for me. But the next thing on that list was like a bottle episode. I'm such a TV nerd. And to get to make this episode directed by Megan Gans, who wrote the bottle episode of Community, which is one of my favorite bottle episodes ever, was an absolute dream. And then to get to play this very complicated storyline that is the culmination essentially of Iron and Poppy's toxic relationship this season. You see her being this really kind of terrible person to everyone around her. Uh, and then in this episode, she admits that she doesn't know what she's doing. She does need Ian after all. And because she's been a jerk for the whole episode, he rejects her. And honestly, it was a really emotional scene to make, especially because we shot the episode in like a play, like we shot it chronologically. Mm. And so we got to the end of this big week of shooting and we shot this scene where Poppy, you know, becomes completely vulnerable and Ian leaves her out in the cold. And um, I just remember doing the first take of that scene and like uh, when Rob like says his line about not believing in her and leaves, I felt it in my stomach and when he came back in after they said cut he gave me a hug which we weren't really allowed to do with COVID but I was like oh. <laughs> that was really nice <laughs> oh that's good what uh, what do you think about um uh like how much of their top uh, and we also learn about Poppy uh, and also she sort of became vulnerable and revealed she doesn't like singing in public mm, yes 
Do you like singing in public, Charlotte? Here's what is interesting about me. I studied to be a professional musician. And you that know. was that was what my whole life was going to be. Like I started playing classical piano when I was four. And then I decided I wanted to be, of all things, a jazz singer. And I actually did one year of university studying to be a jazz singer. And I dropped out partly because I wanted to be an actor. But a big part of it was because I had a lot of trouble singing in public. I would, I I get still so nervous. It, someone's like, "Oh, you you used to study singing. Sing something for us." I'm like, oh, "I can't do it." Uh, so that wasn't that hard to access. Okay, that's good. What? Uh, how much do you reckon of the toxicity between um, uh, between Poppy and Iron is their uh, insecurities about themselves? I think all of it. No. Honestly, all of it. And I think it's really obvious in Iron because uh, we're kind of used to seeing a lot of these um, toxic male tropes. Like we know what a man who's covering insecurity with masculinity looks like. Whereas I don't know that it's been explored so much uh, in female characters. And I would I would argue that a lot of the toxic behavior that you see from Poppy is i wouldn't say like specifically female but it's definitely told from the perspective of a woman we haven't just taken a male character and got a woman to play it like the ways that she i, I wouldn't I, I don't know if i would call this toxic but her insecurity her imposter syndrome i would say is one of her biggest weaknesses you know she knows that she's a good coder but when it comes to leading, she's questioning every single one of her decisions because she's never pictured herself in that role before. She's only been grappling to get it. And then once she's got it, she doesn't know what to do with it. And so, yeah, I think that the way that she treats Dana, it comes from insecurity. The way that she treats her coders, it comes from insecurity. It's like, she doesn't believe that anyone will listen to her. And so when they don't, she's like, fine, that's proof. I see it and I hate you. Mm. And, it, and it's so funny, the relationship, because, like, in some ways, like, Poppy and I bring out the best in each other creatively on one level, but I think they also, like, fuel each other's insecurity. Like, yes, absolutely. And they know how to dig at each other, too. They know what's going to hurt mm -hmm. the other person. Yeah. And I, they know how to get the best work out of each other, and then they know how to destroy each other. Yeah. Very scary. Very scary. <laughs> Another scene I wanted to talk to you about was a bit earlier in the season and your uh, speech at the women's event. Uh, <laughs> how was how that like to perform? you want to talk us through that a bit of your experience there? It was so much fun. I mean, like you get these scenes and again, I mean, speaking of dream jobs, it's like you get a scene like this and it's like, I mean, this is so funny. Even on the page, I was laughing, which is a very rare thing. Um, and then we showed up on the day and as with our the way that we work usually, there's a flexibility and a spontaneity to it. It's very rare that we'll come in and shoot a scene and just do it exactly the same way from start to finish. And part of the reason for that is that we've got all these really talented, clever, funny writers, producers and actors on set that are constantly pitching new ideas for how to up the ante. And so when we shot that scene, we did what we we do pretty often, which is we shot it sort of traditionally. And then we did like at one point, just one big long take where I did the speech and then Rob was like, wait, stop there. Just ramble now. I'll just like say anything that comes into your head. And we did that. And then Megan was like, okay, quick, I'm running up with this card. I've got a new bit of this speech that I want you to say at the start. And so she'd run in and I'd quickly like memorize this thing and then like do the next bit. And they'd be like, let the candy fall out of your bag. And I think having that level of spontaneity when you're shooting something like this that needs a very particular kind of energy just keeps things moving through your body and your mind as you're performing it. And I'll say when I finished shooting the scene that day, I was like, I have no idea what just happened. Like, who knows? Who knows how this is going to turn out? And then, yeah, I was really happy and proud of the way that they they put it together. And I was surprised and excited by the elements that they chose to put into the speech that were really spontaneous choices on the day. Oh, great. Can you think of a choice that you made on that day that you loved? I think one, you know, one of the things that I 
improvised was that thing of it. I think I say something about like, why are you giving me a platform? Like, I think that was something that I said when Rob was like, just ramble, just say anything. I think I said like, I don't know why you're giving me this platform. And that was kind of the thing that was driving the whole, that whole episode for me, the poppy was this idea of, I want to be a programmer. I don't want to be a role model. I don't want to be a feminist icon. I want to make video games. And why am I having to be this spokesperson for women in gaming when none of my male peers have to do that? Um, and so that was kind of the driving force through the episode. And it was cool to get to just uh, vocalize that in the speech because I was given the freedom to. Mm, no, that was really cool. Is there another like scene or moment that like was particularly memorable for you for from season two? Yeah, I, I mean, look, the, this season was an absolute joy to shoot, and there's, I, it's honestly hard to pull things out. Yeah. Um, there's an there's there's a scene coming up, I think, in a couple of more weeks where Rob and I have kind of an emotional more of a dramatic arc in the episode and um you know poppy has gotten to have her moment uh in the quarantine episode especially you get to see her be vulnerable um but this scene is more of iron vulnerability and it was a really amazing day to shoot uh it was like a full day that he and i were really getting to like dig into some you know, chewy drama. And uh, I think we, it was towards the end of the season and, and we had been, you know, following these really strict COVID protocols and we were very aware of how lucky we were to be doing our jobs in the middle of a pandemic. And we were all really committed to making it work. And that particular day, I just remember feeling extremely lucky to be working with the people that I was working with and getting to do these really sort of surprising stories in what is ostensibly a workplace comedy. So I'm really looking forward to people seeing that. Ah, oh, nice. Uh, we've got like Mythic Quest has sort of established for itself a bit of a pattern of being able to do episodes that fall outside of the box, right? Like yeah. we saw Dark Quite Deaf in season one, which you weren't really a part of at all. Uh, no. but you got to be a part of the quarantine episode. You got to be a part of the Everlight episode. Was it nice yeah. to like get to be a part of the sort of special episodes? Uh, Definitely. And you know, Everlight especially was, we got to wear amazing costumes. We got to walk onto this incredibly designed set. And then at the end of the week, we spent a couple of days shooting this action sequence where I got to do fight. I got to learn fight choreography. Danny Pudi does this amazing performance as the darkness itself, where he was wearing just incredible prosthetics. And, you know, again, it's, you have these pinch me moments where we, we, we did a day of shooting where I was, you know, fighting with this stick. I should know what it's called. You know, these, this stick, these, you know, these sticks that, like a, you know, a, 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 what are they? A, staff, a, a staff. Oh, I was say like a foil, like a fencing yeah. foil. No, it was like a, a staff. Yeah, yeah. You, what, you can't tell from this what no, it is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got to do this incredible day of like, I was sweating in this armor costume. And, and, and then at the end of the day, Danny's getting risen into the air with this incredible prosthetics on and there's wind going and the lights are amazing and you're holding this weapon and you're like, how is this my job? This is amazing. So, yeah, I hope we get to do more of those episodes. Yeah, and you got to get hit in the face with oranges. Yes, I mean, what a dream come true. Yeah. I did all my own stunts in that. Really? Uh, that uh, gag, yes. <laughs> did you have to just get down before the orange got to you or did you let it hit you? Or was it no, like a the, the foam thing? the movie magic is there's no ball. Ah, uh, okay. We we mime it all and then and then the, and we did this incredible camera move where the camera is whipping from me to Rob and then back to me. So you're kind of using the camera as a guide. And then when it gets back to me, I have to like throw my head back and throw myself backwards over this chair. Um, 
It was very fun. <laughs> it was a very cartoon moment. And I mean that in like a great way. Yeah. I, I think in a lot of ways I'm a very cartoon person, so yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Did you have star? Did you have actual staffs, or was you were you just like this the whole time and they put that? No, in no, as no. Well? We no, had go- real weapons for, okay. the, for the action sequence. There you go. Yeah, it was it was really fun getting to learn how to do that stuff. I'm a big Star Wars fan, and um, uh, our stunt coordinator Shahab was. Uh, telling me that this was like a Darth Maul move. And I was like, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. Um, ja, just to finish off, what um, what was you, the funniest moment in season two of Mythic Quest for you? The funniest moment, I wasn't even in the scene. The funniest moment for me is David Hornsby being the wolf in, in this episode, the bottle episode that just recently came out. I stayed back the day that they were shooting that just to get to watch him in that costume doing a flip over the table. And it was worth every moment of, of extra time on set. Uh, he uh-huh. is a genius and we couldn't stop laughing at that moment. Boy, him like saying goodbye about three times with the how was so funny. Really, so, he just his entire performance in that episode is gold. Yeah. Well, Charlotte, thanks so much for chatting with us today. People watching this interview can go to goldderby.com to make your awards predictions, watch other videos with awards contenders, and go uh, and join the discussion in our forums. Charlotte, all the best of luck for the Emmy Awards this year. Thank you, and you too. Ah, I'll I'll see how I can do. Like I'll see <laughs> how I go. Okay. Thanks very much.